Americans became familiar with the violence of organized crime during the bootlegger and prohibition era, but most Americans had no idea of the true extent of mob crime until, well, after the Second World War. In 1950, a freshman U.S. Senator, Estes Kefauver, took on organized crime at the head of a special committee. The so-called Kefauver hearings were held in major cities across the country, and the ones that were televised live became a sensation, and the first place that many Americans came face to face with the mob. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Organized crime began in large American cities like New York, often in marginalized ethnic neighborhoods. Many of them began as locally focused street gangs that expanded to organizations that acted citywide and later even nationwide. Of course, it's well known that prohibition provided fertile ground for what became the largest crime syndicates who used bootlegging and illegal bars to make fortunes. Some powerful gangs formed within Sicilian communities and integrated members of the Italian mafia fleeing Mussolini's Italy. Violence became endemic as the games fought over territory and supplies, bringing rise to famous mobsters like Al Capone. In New York, the fighting culminated in Charles Lucky Luciano creating the commission to lead, govern, and protect the interests of sanctioned crime families. When Prohibition ended, the families moved into new industries, including criminal enterprises like gambling, labor racketeering, extortion, and drug trafficking. They supported gambling as a legal enterprise in Nevada and Las Vegas and used huge sums of money to quietly bribe and evade local police departments and judges, which had neither the knowledge nor the resources to combat the well-organized cross-state criminal enterprises. In 1949, stories about organized crime started to appear prominently in American newspapers. Crime commissions in cities like Chicago reported that there was corruption among local officials. The American Municipal Association, which represented some 10,000 cities and towns, petitioned the government to do something about organized crime. Well, Democrat Estes Kefauver was only in his first term as a senator representing Tennessee. He had been in the House of Representatives since 1939 and had conspicuously supported President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Kefauver had run against the Democratic machine in Tennessee, run by E.H. Crump. He answered the growing call for action by drafting a resolution to allow the Senate Judiciary Committee to investigate organized crimes activities in relation to interstate commerce. This caused a problem because the Senate Committee on Interstate and Foreign Commerce claimed jurisdiction. And eventually, a compromise resolution was introduced that would create a special committee of five senators that drew from both committees. Still, some senators opposed the committee as it was against the spirit of the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1946, which had nearly eliminated special committees altogether. Opposition was so strong that the vote was tied, and Vice President Alvin Barkley cast the tie-breaking vote to establish the committee. The Special Committee to Investigate Organized Crime in Interstate Commerce was tasked with investigating whether organized crime utilizes the facilities of interstate commerce or otherwise operates in interstate commerce. And if so, who or what kind of organization was responsible? Kefauver was made the committee chairman, which led to the committee being popularly called the Kefauver Committee. Barkley also chose the remaining members, Herbert O'Connor of Maryland, Lester Hunt of Wyoming, Alexander Wiley of Wisconsin, and Charles Toby of New Hampshire. Kefauver directed the committee to focus its efforts on what he called the lifeblood of organized crime, interstate gambling. Kefauver promised to lead a no stone unturned, no holds barred, right down the middle of the road, let the chips fall where they may investigation, no matter the political fallout. The first hearing was held in Miami on May 28, 1950. Almost immediately, they found gambling everywhere, openly and notoriously, and apparently with the full knowledge of the entire community. In the committee's report, they reported that law enforcement, incredibly, claimed they didn't know anything about gambling activity. Known gangsters from states as far away as New York, Pennsylvania, and Michigan had headquarters at hotels in Miami. Kefauver concluded that the sheriff of Dade County had done nothing to enforce the Florida laws, and several members of his staff testified to corruption within the office. The sheriff of Broward County got most of his income from a business which ran gambling activities. Many gangsters and witnesses refused to appear at all, which the report said is strongly indicative of an admission of guilt. Perhaps most shockingly, the investigation traced connections between gambling businesses and contributions made to Florida Governor Fuller Warren. Affirming his commitment to a no-holds-barred investigation, Kefauver reported the information even though Warren was in his party. Warren said Kefauver was an ambition-crazed Caesar who was trying desperately and futilely to become president. The governor refused to appear before the committee, citing states' rights, but his political career was over.
The hearings went on for 15 months. When the committee was set to expire in February 1951, public outcry led to it being extended until September. Hearings were held in 14 cities, from New York to Chicago to Los Angeles, and everywhere the committee went, they found evidence of mob activity, uncooperative witnesses, and official corruption. Kefauver described Kansas City as a place that was struggling out from under the rule of law in the jungle. The investigation in Missouri uncovered mob support for Governor Forrest Smith. Mobster Charlie Benaggio had helped to elect the governor, hoping to open up the state. One of the most important resources for many gangs was control of race wires. Originally envisioned by John Payne, a former telegraph operator for Western Union, they were telegraph services that specifically sent coded reports of horse racing and other kinds of betting. These wires were controlled completely by the mob. The committee learned that in Miami, the wires were controlled by the Capone gang, while Benjamin Bugsy Siegel controlled them in Las Vegas. Siegel was murdered. While the case remains unsolved, it may have been something to do with his control of the race wires. These wire services charged establishments and bookies to receive the results or cut off access to the results. The Chicago investigation implicated many public officials in mob schemes and corrupt practices, which helped to sink Chicago representative and House Majority Leader Scott Lucas's campaign, resulting in defeat in November. At the time, fellow senators were dismissive of the committee. One senator metaphorically rolled his eyes when Kefauver's absence was noted. He isn't here. He's out chasing them crapshooters. A Washington Post columnist said, It's like investigating sin in the common cold. Perennial evils, which through the centuries have proven fairly invulnerable to law. But Kefauver had faith in one of the things that would become one of the committee's greatest strengths. Television. He wrote, Television gives the public a third dimension that helps to interpret what is actually going on. And his faith was well placed. When the committee started airing live in January of 1951, no complaint by the witnesses about their privacy could stop the hearings from becoming a juggernaut of public attention. When Missouri betting commissioner James Carroll refused to testify, saying, I do not expect to be made an object of ridicule, Kefauver answered that he would not permit the arrangements of this hearing to be dictated by a witness. Television was still a fairly new technology, and fewer than half of American homes had a television. Many of those who didn't have one watched the hearings in bars, restaurants, and businesses, and they even played in some movie theaters. In March, 20 to 30 million people watched the New York hearings. In 1950, there wasn't enough programming to fill the schedules of even a handful of channels. Primetime had good coverage, but there was often nothing at all on during the day. The Kefauver hearings provided some riveting content. Time Magazine helped sponsor the hearings in New York and Washington, D.C., promoting magazine subscriptions. The hearings were a hit, as Life Magazine noted. Looking at millions of frosty screens, people sat as if charmed. Never before had the attention of the nation been riveted so completely on a single matter. The U.S. adjusted itself to Kefauver's schedule. Dishes stood in sinks, babies went unfed, business sagged, and department stores emptied when the hearings were on, said Time Magazine. In the middle of it all was Senator Kefauver, warning of a sinister criminal organization at work in America's cities. Possibly the biggest draw of the televised hearings was the cast of characters the committee interrogated, criminals as suave and well-mannered as their investigators. The mobsters looked like they had stepped right out of a crime movie, well-dressed and belligerent, while corrupt officials were rattled by the questioning. An L.A. gangster Mickey Cohen, when asked if he had surrounded himself with acts of violence, responded, I have not murdered anybody. All the shooting has been done at me. In New Orleans, when Sheriff admitted on television that he had a safe in his bedroom with ten or $15,000. Look here, all this is going to go over the radio and this television. You're just inviting burglars, the sheriff worried. There's quite a few burglars around here, the committee council agreed. Others seem to develop amnesia or plead the fifth, their constitutional right not to incriminate themselves in their own testimony. When they arrived in Las Vegas, many of the high-profile casino owners had simply skipped town. In St. Louis, bars are said to have done better business than they did during the World Series. In Los Angeles and San Francisco, the hearings uncovered illegal payouts and mob activity and drew some of the largest audiences then recorded for daytime television. The committee questioned a number of important mob figures like Tony Accardo, Joe Adonis, gangsters with nicknames like The Waiter, Little New York, and Greasy Thumb Guzik. By far the greatest drum of the hearing came during the eight days the committee spent in New York City in March 1951. Frank Costello, said to be a key mob figure in gambling syndicates, drew enormous attention. His carefully coiffed hair and tailored suits would help to define the image of the Italian-American mobster. 
Costello refused at first to testify because microphones would prevent him from conferring privately with his lawyer, but a compromise was made that the live broadcast would focus only on Costello's hands, which twisted and clenched, revealing inner fears and confusion. Costello quickly bowed to the pressure of the questions, refusing to answer and becoming belligerent and even mumbling incoherently. In one appearance, he abruptly announced he was sick and walked out of the courtroom. He was cited for contempt and he served prison time for it. Though the committee hadn't proven many of the allegations against him, they won a ring endorsement from the public, who saw Costello as a kind of living embodiment of the mob. Another highlight was the testimony of Virginia Hill Hauser, once a girlfriend of Bugsy Siegel. She came to the testimony dressed in a mink cape, suede gloves, and a huge hat. She arrived late and described in a whiny voice how she had met some fellas at the Chicago World's Fair in 1933, where she had been slinging hash. She said she was given gifts by some of the fellows, but that she knew nothing about any illegal activity. She backtalked the committee and added considerable color to the show, explaining she had had a fight with Siegel because she hit a girl at the hotel and he told me I wasn't a lady. When she left, she belted one reporter and kicked another. Her parting words to the press were, I hope the atom bomb falls on every one of you. Not long after, she fled the country to avoid a tax evasion charge from the IRS. The hearings continued throughout the summer, but Kefauver resigned his position, possibly out of exhaustion, but maybe because he sensed he was testing the patience of the Truman White House. The committee produced an 11,000-page report, drew back the curtain on organized crime for the first time for many Americans. The term Capo del Capi, the boss of bosses, or godfather, was first introduced to the public memory at these hearings. They revealed extensive evidence of organized crime's influence on business and politics, although they also found that most of the organization was focused locally or regionally and less nationally. Although the report recommended a number of avenues for legislation, almost all the legislative recommendations of the final report went unanswered. And the FBI, led by J. Edgar Hoover, remained more focused on communism than on organized crime for some time. Until in 1957, when the bust of dozens of mafia bosses at the Appalachian Summit forced Hoover to deal with the threat seriously. However, it did inspire further investigations. The defeat of several gambling referenda across the country and more than 70 crime commissions were established to deal with the problem at the state and local level. The hearings made Estes Kefauver a national celebrity, he appeared on television shows. In December, he was voted one of the ten most admired men, putting him right up there with Albert Einstein, Pope Pius XII, and Douglas MacArthur. He leveraged that fame into two presidential runs in 1952 and 1956, and in 1960 was Adlai Stevenson's running mate against the Republicans Dwight Eisenhower and Richard Nixon. One of the more negative effects of the committee hearings was it gave Americans the impression that mob activity in America was the result primarily of the Italian-American mafia, which is still kind of part of the public perception of a mobster, but in reality, many ethnic groups and other groups were involved in organized crime. The committee's connection to television is also important. It reinforced the value of television news and the power of a visual medium like television over a media like print and radio. It inspired crime exposés and a wave of fiction from Hollywood, and Estes Kefauver even appeared bookending a mob film warning against the dangers of organized crime. More than perhaps any other event, the Kefauver Committee brought organized crime into the American consciousness. Mob history like this and many other stories and artifacts are stored in Las Vegas in the historic former U.S. Post Office and Courthouse, now the Mob Museum, the very building where the Kefauver Committee held its hearings in the city. The courtroom has been restored and you can see where the committee questioned mob associates such as Mo Sedway, Wilbur Clark, and Nevada Lieutenant Governor Cliff Jones. Every year the Mob Museum celebrates November 15th as Kefauver Day. You can learn more at themobmuseum.org. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow the History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.